Next up, we're going to talk about RH incompatibility, also known as hemolytic disease of the newborn. So basically, this is going to be when there's a pregnant woman, and this pregnant woman's developed antibodies to foreign RBCs. Usually, these are going to be against those of her current or her previous fetus, but a lot of times this can also happen um, secondary to transfusion. So what we want to go over is the risk factors, the protective factors, as well as the requirements. Now, our risk factors for RH incompatibility include amniocentesis, ectopic pregnancy, DNC, abrupto placenta, and placenta previa. This can happen when the woman's transfused with mismatched RBCs, or it can also happen when the fetal RBCs enter the mother circulation transplacentally at delivery. Some protective factors are ABO incompatibility. If a patient has ABO incompatibility, there's actually a decreased risk of maternal isoimmunization from foreign RBCs. What happens is there's naturally occurring anti-A and anti-B antibodies, and these are gonna rapidly lyse the foreign red blood cells, but before the maternal lymphocytes are stimulated to produce active antibodies. And next, we're gonna talk about our requirements of isoimmunization, also known as RH incompatibility. In order for us to diagnose RH incompatibility, all of these are gonna to have to be present, okay? The fetus antigen, has to be positive. This means that the father of the pregnancy must also be antigen positive. The mother's antigen has to be negative. RH antibodies titers, when you do them, they have to be over a ratio of one to eight. Adequate RBCs have to cross over into the circulation because um, the RBCs have to cross over in order to stimulate the mother's lymphocytes to produce antibodies to the fetal RBC antigens. Now, so we know the risk factors, we know what's a protective factor they can ask us, and we know what you need as diagnostic criteria. So let's talk about how to manage these patients. So first step, we want to determine if there's a fetal risk, okay? And the, what, the, the way we're going to do this is by amniocentesis or percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. And basically, the fetal risk is only going to be present if any of these, if all of these are positive, okay? So once we've determined whether there's a fetal risk pre, uh, present based on these following requirements, what we have to do is assess the degree of anemia and what we're going to the way we're going to do this is we're going to measure the amniotic fluid bilirubin level now the amniotic fluid bilirubin indirectly indicates fetal hemolysis because bilirubin actually accumulates as a byproduct of rbc lysis and basically this bilirubin is going to be plotted on something known as the lily graph and if the patient is in the lily zone one, that means there's no risk. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna repeat the test in three weeks. If it is in lily zone two, this is known to be moderate risk, and we're gonna repeat it in one to two weeks. If they're in lily zone three, that means these patients are high risk, and what we have to do is we have to look at their gestational age. If their gestational age is less than 34 weeks, we're going to do intrauterine, intravascular transfusion, and phenobarbital. And if their gestational age is over 34 weeks, we know the lungs are mature, so we're going to just go ahead and deliver the baby. So what do we do to prevent this? So we, we, know, we just learned how to manage it, and we want to prevent this by giving Rogam. What Rogam is, is it's pooled anti-D IgG passive antibodies. And these are going to be given intramuscularly to pregnant women when there's a significant risk of fetal RBCs passing into the circulation. So our, all RHD negative moms are going to be given Rogam at 28 weeks. And then we're going to give it again within 72 hours after delivery. And we're going to also give it with any procedures 
that can possibly cause a transplacental hemorrhage. And examples of this would be amniocentesis, chorionic villus sampling, as well as DNC. There's a test you're going to be responsible for. It's called the Clive Hauer Betke test. And this is actually going to quantitate the volume of the RBCs in the maternal um, circulation by differential staining of the fetal and maternal RBCs on peripheral smear. It's going to be used to assess the rogam given in large volume bleeds. So an example of a large volume bleed that can happen is abrupto placenta. So we're going to do this test to, quanti uh, to quantitate the volume of the RBCs in the maternal circulation. So basically, this is what we're responsible for on the test, RH incompatibility. We, we're going to need to know the prevention. So all RHD negative moms are going to be given Rogam at 28 and 72 weeks, and we're going to do this test in large bleeds. Our risk factors are going to be amniocentesis, ectopic pregnancy, DNC, abrupto, and placenta previa. Protective factors, remember, are ABO incompatibility. And all of these have to be positive in order to make a diagnosis. So the fetus antigen has to be positive. The mom antigen has to be negative. The titers have to be over the ratio of 1 to 8. And adequate RBCs have to cross into the circulation. So we're going to determine the fetal risk by doing amniocentesis and percutaneous umbilical blood sampling. And then we're going to measure the level of the anemia by the bilirubin level. Based on the lily zone, we're going to either repeat in three weeks, repeat in one to two weeks, or we are going to do an intrauterine intravascular transfusion with phenobarb if they're less than 34 weeks and then lily zone three. And if they're over 34 weeks, we're going to just deliver the baby. So babies are not going to be at risk if there's no atypical antibodies and the titers less than one, a ratio of one to eight. And if the titer is less than a ratio of one to eight, what we're going to do is we're going to repeat monthly titers. So if the fetus antigen is positive and the mom antigen is negative and they have um, adequate RBCs, they didn't meet all the criteria. So if the titer is less than one to eight, we're going to repeat monthly titers. And we're going to manage them accordingly if the titers go over um, one to eight. And this is pretty much everything that we need to know when it comes to isoimmunization for OB-GYN. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Take care.